All right. Welcome to, to today's session of Open Texas 2022. I'm Ariana Santiago, and I will be uh, moderating this session. Thank you all for joining us today for the presentations. And I will go ahead and pass it over to our first presenters, Heidi and Sabrina. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Let me go ahead and share my screen. One second. Okay. Is everyone seeing the correct screen? Okay. Good afternoon. My name is Heidi Winkler. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as digital services librarian at Texas Tech University. I'm joined by my colleagues, colleague Sabrina Davis, who serves as open educational resources librarian. Today, we'll be talking with you about the imposter phenomenon in open education advocates, which is work that we're at the very beginning of exploring. We have a high level review of the existing literature to share, as well as a few tips and tricks if you find yourself or your colleagues struggling with feelings of imposter syndrome. We welcome your thoughts and questions to help us shape the work to come. So let's start at the beginning uh, with the 1978 Clance and Imes article that introduced the phrase imposter phenomenon to the literature, specifically pertaining to high achieving women. Sabrina and I are academic librarians and most of our colleagues identify as female or femme. So this research fits in quite nicely with our own work. The authors wrote about a sample of about 100 primarily white middle to upper class women of undergraduate and faculty status located at a private Midwestern college from various fields and who experienced feelings of quote, intellectual phoniness. This is not a particularly diverse sample and I would assume that most of the women within this sample come from uh, privilege of, of the social and economic uh, variety. But the authors presented claims about common experiences of these women that may ring true for many of you. So I wanted to share. People who self-identified as imposters fear that eventually someone important will find them out for the frauds that they feel themselves to be. Some, for example, convinced themselves that they were admitted to graduate school only because of an admissions committee mistake, which upon reading that was the moment that I personally realized I've never experienced an original thought. Many of the women in the study come from a family where they were not considered to be the intelligent sibling, um, and their hard work that they put into their academic achievements was not acknowledged. It was assumed that anything that they achieved was because, you know, not because they were bright, but because they had the right social skills or were sensitive to people's needs. And as soon as they internalized that, so would their imposter phenomena set in. On the flip side, um, other women in the study were told by their families and their peers that they were the smart ones, that they were superior to their peers in terms of intellect, personality, and talent. And as soon as these women failed to achieve something that they wanted, something that they had set out to do, they began to doubt the external perception of their intellect and imposter phenomena would set in. And now Sabrina will talk about what happens when these self-described intellectual phonies grow up and become librarians. Thanks, Heidi. Um, so there's quite a bit of literature about imposter phenomenon in general, but since Heidi and I are both academic librarians, we wanted to explore it from that angle. So in our search of the literature, this is a very nearly complete list of everything that we found that mentioned imposter syndrome and academic librarians specifically. Um, as you can see, there's not a whole lot there. Next slide. But we learned quite a bit. Um, so it's clear from the literature that much to my and Heidi's dismay, academic librarians are not immune to feelings of imposter syndrome. In fact, according to one study by Clark, Vardaman, and Barba, nearly one in eight academic librarians that they surveyed have feelings of imposter syndrome. And that's just from the sample that they had. I would bet that the in reality, it's probably a much bigger number. So when looking at the literature, it became very evident that there were a few reoccurring reasons as to why academic librarians were experiencing imposter syndrome. These ranged from being new to a professional role, um, not having enough time for professional development, 
um, underrepresentation in the profession in general. Uh, for those that don't know, librarianship is predominantly white. Um, and then my personal favorite being, <laughs> um, and feelings of imposter syndrome can also come up uh, if you are the youngest or if you are very early on in your career. Um, as a younger millennial who kind of borders on Gen Z and as someone who is still very early in her career, I definitely identified um, with, with that one and, and the feelings of imposter syndrome that come up with that. Next slide. Okay, so that was academic librarians in general, um, but Heidi and I also wanted to know how imposter syndrome affected scholarly communications librarians. Why that particular group? Well, OER and open ed responsibilities are sometimes additions uh, to what those in those positions are already doing. Um, so according to NASIG, there are core competencies that scholarly communications librarians should have. These core competencies include knowledge in institutional repositories, publishing, copyright, data management, and assessment in all metrics. These areas of knowledge are important for later, I promise. So like other academic librarians, scholarly communications librarians have various things that impact their competence. Uh, the largest factor being too many responsibilities, which I can understand why followed closely by, again, just time in the job. So if you're earlier on in your career, um, you tend to have more feelings of imposter syndrome. And then just another, again, lack of time to participate in professional development opportunities. Next slide. Okay, so how does this translate to open ed and OER advocates? Well, as I said, Heidi and I focused a lot on librarians because that's what we are. Um, and the reason we chose scholarly communications librarians is because typically librarians at institutions are the ones that are helping to lead the way um, for OER and open ed initiatives at their campus. <clears throat> so as you're looking at the slide here, um, you'll, you'll, you'll kind of see some commonalities um, with what open ed and OER advocates are doing um, and how they kind of relate to what scholarly communications librarians do. So open licensing kind of goes along with copyright, uh, open access and OER creation goes with publishing um, with some addition, uh, additional uh, responsibilities here, such as outreach and marketing strategies, project man management, and then advocacy. Um, to multiple campus stakeholders. Now, this list is not at all comprehensive of everything that OER and open ed advocates do, um, but it does show that they're doing a lot <laughs> and that some of this may lay outside the comfort zone for many librarians. So for example, communicating and advocating to some campus stakeholders like those in administration or po other policymakers is not always something that's covered when you're getting a library degree. Um, so unfortunately, there was not a class called how to talk to your provost 101, as helpful as that would have been. There may also be the added pressure to feel like you have to know every single thing about all the areas of knowledge that I've listed here, which I don't think that's possible, um, but that pressure is definitely there, you know, that you have to know every single minute detail about open licensing or how open access works, um, assessment, et cetera. So since librarians, usually scholarly communications librarians, as I said, are the ones typically, but not always, uh, leading the charge of open ed and, and OER advocacy, we think that it's important to understand how feelings of imposter syndrome can and likely do affect their work. Um, and since there hasn't been a lot of research done on this yet, Heidi and I would like to turn this into a larger study um, of OER and open ed advocates and librarians at their institutions. So more to look forward to. Next slide. Now that said, <laughs> We know that we as OER and open ed advocates have struggled with our own feelings of imposter syndrome. And we wanted to provide just a few tips and tricks 
um, for those of you who may also be struggling. Next slide. The earliest Clance and Imes work noted that one of the most effective therapeutic treatments against imposter phenomenon was talking openly about imposter feelings and experiences with peers in a group setting, be it formal or informal. Not only will it bring relief to find that you're not alone, it's also a good way to challenge your beliefs about yourself when you see those same beliefs in another person that are just so clearly not based in reality. Eventually, you'll figure out that you too are worthy of believing the hype about yourself. So the literature also mentioned, um, you know, how having formal and or informal mentorships can help. Um, I think it's important to look for those mentorships, both within and outside of open education and the OER world. Um, so, you know, within the OER world, uh, everyone that's kind of in that space will understand what you're going through for sure. Um, but those outside, so especially if you're someone who's younger in your career, like myself, um, having, you know, maybe a, a, a formal or informal mentor just within the profession in general, or maybe who's more um, further along, maybe in higher ed in general, can be super helpful with those feelings of imposter syndrome. Um, I would also rec recommend keeping regular communication either with a mentor or your supervisor. Um, that way you can get consistent feedback on not only what you're doing um, as far as initiatives and things like that, but you can also get feedback on how you're progressing and meeting the responsibilities that are set for your role. And then lastly, just venting is so therapeutic. Um, so, you know, if, if the person that you vent to is your mentor, then that's, that's always nice, but, you know, get, get the frustration out as much as you can. And while we've focused on people's individual feelings, we also don't want to let systems off the hook. There was a great Harvard Business Review article published last year that challenged the individualization of imposter phenomena when we should be looking at how organizations and workplaces treat the people who work for them. So if you're in a leadership role in your institution, interrogate whether your organization really values competence or confidence. And who gets praised when they display that confidence? And who may get subtly punished when they display that confidence? There's evidence that says that women, people of color, trans women, people within uh, marginalized communities are punished for displaying confidence and trying to be ambitious. So who gets rewarded for being confident and ambitious? And who gets punished? Are people allowed to be themselves? Or must they project an air of perfection in order to seem professional? And then lastly, I think it's also important to recognize that sometimes it really just is a lot of work. Um, you know, we as librarians do a ton of juggling. And as the theme of this conference has highlighted this week, there's a lot of labor that goes into being an OER or open education advocate. So while you're doing all the amazing things that you're doing, it's important to also take care of you. Maintain a work-life balance that works for you, however that looks. Um, and then remember to be kind to yourself. <laughs> Not everything will always go according to plan. So remember to give yourself a little grace and just the patience to be human. And lastly, I wanted to share something that my supervisor told me the first day when I started last year. Um, he said that the work that I would be doing in the OER and open ed realm uh, would be a marathon and not a sprint. And I think that is correct. You know, for me as the OER librarian, it can be so tempting uh, to compare what my institution is doing with what other institutions are doing. And so I feel pressure to do a million and 10 things at once just to catch up. Um, but I think it's important to remember that every institution is different and that change, especially mindset change, takes time. Next slide.
And that's the end. And um, we did want to share this uh, nice little funny tweet for those that enjoy cats. Um, I would say this is 100% accurate. My cat feels no imposter syndrome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Heidi and Sabrina. That was fantastic. We'll now transition into a few minutes of Q&A. So if any attendees have questions, feel free to put them in the chat, or if you'd prefer to unmute your microphone and ask your question verbally, you're welcome to do so as well. We have a few minutes. While we're waiting for other questions to come in, um, I had a question. <laughs> I, I think for me, and I, Heidi may have a different opinion, but for me, I think it's definitely uh, communicating and advocating to different stakeholders, especially uh, administration. Um, I, I know that's where I have struggled. Um, and I've, I've heard other OER advocates or librarians have struggled with in the past, um, but I'd be curious to see what others think. And I would just add on, you know, um, a lot of this work is, is, it feels like you're telling other people how to do their job. And that you're coming into their space and and telling them that they've been wrong all this time, um, and so that that takes a lot of courage. Um, and if you are not that expert in that subject area, then um, you're you're going to feel like you have no idea what you're doing. All right, thank you so much. Um, we'll see if there are any other questions that folks want to put in the chat to ask our presenters. And if there are not any other questions, I also have another one for you. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering uh, if you have recommendations for where or how people can find formal or informal mentors in open education. Um, I would definitely say um, if, if, if you're in Texas, um, you know, there's the OER ambassadors through Texas Digital Libraries. Um, those are good people to, to work with and to kind of reach out to. Um, various listservs that exist that are related to OER. I know Spark has a really good one. Um, you know, and just asking um, for good, for someone that'd be willing to mentor you. Um, or, or if there's an institution that you're like, oh, they're doing great things. I'd really love to chat with that OER librarian or whatever, um, you know, reaching out directly to them as well. All right, well, I wanna thank you both so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Um, so we'll wrap this one up and I'll go ahead and pause the recording. Okay, welcome to today's session of the Open Texas 2022 conference. Uh, my name is Ariana and I'm the MC for this session. Thank you all for joining us today and I will go ahead and hand it over to our presenter, Brad. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ariana, and thank you very much to all of the participants on the call for signing in today. My name is Brad Griffith, and I serve as Director of Online Learning Initiatives for the Oklahoma State Regents for Higher Education, and I'm here today to tell you a story about Oklahoma's OER Basics and Beyond, which is an adaptation story of Texas Learn OER. Uh, just a bit of background about myself before we get into the actual presentation of this. I, as I mentioned, work for the state regents in Oklahoma, which is the coordinating board for Oklahoma's 25 public colleges and universities. As part of my duties at the state regents, I actually serve as liaison to the two groups that you can see listed over my shoulder here. One of those is the Online Consortium of Oklahoma, which is a 25 member consortium group of institutions that exist in our state. They work on things and all related to online education and one of their pillar projects is open educational resources and providing strategic and collective investments in OER opportunities for our state. Well, I also have the privilege of working with the other group, which is our Council for Online Learning Excellence. And this is actually where our statewide OER council is housed in Oklahoma higher education. 
We have over 120 members of our Oklahoma Online Learning Council and our OER committee alone has over 45 individuals that actually take part in regular monthly meetings, as well as sharing all of the wonderful resources and opportunities that we've developed for our faculty and staff across the state. So again, here today to tell you a particular story uh, that we have now uh, underway about how we've adapted this wonderful training that Texas developed uh, a year or two ago. So to provide a bit of a timeline on this project, all of this really started back in October of 2020 for us. As I mentioned with that online consortium of Oklahoma group, those member institutions actually paid dues to our agency at the state regents to fund shared and collaborative projects. One of those that we invested in early on as a consortium, because we were founded in 2018, was an instance of Pressbooks EDU that's actually shared by our member institutions and available to all of the faculty and staff that teach at those institutions to develop OER projects. We were so fortunate in the timing of the Texas Learn OER team, uh, and again, special thank you to Carrie Gitz, who I believe is on the call today, uh, for the amazing work and this foundation that you set out uh, through the work that you did at Austin Community College, as well as the Texas Higher Ed Coordinating Board uh, in this project. But Ultimately, with the launch, which I believe happened around, which uh, kind of hints the about symbol there, for December of 2020, uh, we realized that there was an opportunity for us to really combine these two resources together uh, and use a lot of the work that Carrie did in the Texas Higher Ed Coordinating Board team uh, at the end of the day to grow and offer trainings to our own audience in Oklahoma. So January through April, after that training was released and started being marketed to consortiums and other individuals across the globe, our statewide OER council worked hard to adapt that training. So we had a group of three individuals, which I'll mention on an upcoming slide, that actually went through and completed the Texas training and really got an understanding of what was involved, the outcomes, the structure, uh, to figure out whether or not it would meet the needs and what may need to be modified you know, or adapted on top of that for our unique audience and where we were strategically with OER at that time, which I would argue was very much in its infancy in our system. So in April 2021, and again, I'm going to describe some of this process a bit more in depth, we did launch our OER Basics and Beyond as a two-part micro-credential. And thank you so much for sharing those links as well uh, in the chat. I uh, appreciate that about the Texas Learn OER and our website there. Um, so again, with April and the launching of that two-part, as we adapted it, micro-credential, we were now able to offer and scale up a training for open educational resources uh, in open practices to all the faculty and staff across our state, uh, which has come in handy time and time again, uh, you know, having this kind of foundation over the last couple of years. Uh, one of the things, too, that's happened most recently is Oklahoma in our higher education, our board actually did allocate some new funding towards open educational resources for the very first time. And so we were and are, I should say, are going to be able to because we just uh, launched this fund awards. So completion awards for faculty and staff that also work with faculty in a support role uh, because there are many uh, many individuals that are required to take part in the OER initiatives on a campus, uh, but providing some financial incentives for them to actually complete the first part of that training, which is really what we felt was the most important. So a little bit about Texas Learn OER, which uh, I hope many of you, if not all of you, are aware of what Texas Learn OER is and may have actually earned the certificate, but it was actually built on Google Sites. So it's a really good and accessible platform that has subheadings, learning interactions that take place in there, uh, and is really ultimately easy to navigate and kind of work your way through. I would also argue able to find what you need in it as an ongoing resource. It is structured within a series of 10 modules, which really starts out with an overview of what open education is, what Creative Commons licenses are, how you find OER, and then it moves on into the more in-depth topics such as accessibilities, uh, Creative Commons licensing in depth, particularly if you're going to be creating or contributing to the world of OER, uh, and then ultimately how you can adapt, share, and ultimately uh, create OER over time with differing tools. The Texas audience has to get an 80% or better mark on the Texas Learn OER quiz, which actually sits at the very end of the module 10. So as a final assessment there, 
And ultimately the completers of this are issued a certificate and it's equivalent to 0.3 CEUs because it takes about three hours for the average individual to go through. Uh, so I provided the link on there again, because it's a wonderful setup. You know, if you have access to Google sites and that's, you know, the platform that you have available at your hands to build this in, it really can be adapted, I think, to any platform that you have. We just happened to have acquired that Pressbooks EDU instance at that time for our consortium and saw this opportunity to bring it over to our platform uh, to really expose individuals, our faculty and staff to that opportunity. So within that process of converting to Pressbooks, it was relatively easy for us. Uh, and again, we had an, a team of individuals, which you can see listed down there, and I'll go over shortly, that were working on this and collaborating over those series of months. Mind you, while we all have full-time jobs with duties related elsewhere, uh, this was really a volunteer project at the end of the day for the editors that contributed to this book. Pressbooks, one of the good features that it has to offer is being able to import content via URL. So that was actually the method that we used to bring over the content from the Google site, uh, which again, does maintain the integrity of those heading structures for accessibility and the other things that were built in for that matter uh, by the original creators. We did actually kind of uh, realize along the way in that process that Considering that the Texas Learn OER is based on Google Sites, a lot of the materials that are downloadable, uh, interactions and resources are actually housed under the Google Drive that is managed, I believe, uh, by those that are managing the Texas Learn OER program. So obviously for the sake of continuity and wanting to provide direct links to our own audience, there was a back layer process there that had to occur where we transferred all of those ancillary files uh, and links and actually made copies of them within our centralized Google Drive network so that we could again connect directly to our own resources and ensure that that material is available on a continuous basis without changing the links. Obviously, Creative Commons licensing empowers us to be able to do all of this. Uh, we did also decide along the way to create a companion course because we have a Moodle instance that, again, we use for our consortium projects and council projects. And so, again, the thought in mind there by our team that was developing this is let's create a companion course that actually gives a faculty member an understanding of how a Pressbooks OER open textbook or resource could actually integrate into a course learning management system experience. So, again, they are completely open. You don't have to log in, you know, to our open OCO Pressbooks portal to be able to view this book. But we do offer faculty that kind of onboarding experience that's traditional to a course so that they can understand, again, if they want to use Pressbooks in their own class, how that experience may unfold, how the hyperlinks may actually work, you know, where they would direct their learners to those instructional materials in Pressbooks. We did also, again, decide at the point along the way in our editing process that we needed to ultimately split up the Texas Learn OER content into two specific buckets. So what we actually have now, and I'll cover on an upcoming slide, is a two-part sequence that's the OER 101, so initial really basic knowledge of open educational resources, and then the OER champion badge, which goes on to those deeper uh, level resources in part two. Before I go on to that, though, I do want to give a special shout out to Dr. Pamela Lauterbach from Northeastern State University, Jamie Holmes from Tulsa Community College, and Ann Rea from Oklahoma City Community College, who served as our editors on this project and put in countless hours of work uh, to really get this done. A couple of the special features that we enjoyed and really, I think, hooked us to bring the Texas Learn OER content to Pressbooks uh, are as follows on the screen here. So we have H5P embedded learning activities that are littered throughout. So this provides individuals an opportunity for knowledge checks, for reflective elements, for drag and drop activities that again, provide a little bit more interaction with the content and also an opportunity for reflection along the way. Uh, so again, a little bit of work that had to go in on our part there to decide where should we actually plug in some of these knowledge checks or learning activities along the way, how substantive should they be at the end of the day, and how can we really help individuals prepare for that final assessment that they'll have to take with us, much as they do uh, with the Texas Learn OER program. Uh, 
Another thing that I really appreciate about, about Pressbooks, and I know this exists in Google Sites as well as other platforms that have a live editing function, but Pressbooks does a great job of maintaining version history. So you can imagine with four or five people that are navigating and working on these chapters, it was very important for us to understand, you know, Jamie had been editing this one yesterday, so I may want to not work on this one, uh, you know, but also I think again, just to maintain those different versions over time and understand how it is that we're adapting and editing the work. Uh, it's all there. As I mentioned, here's a screenshot of the Moodle companion course. So we have modules that are structured that provide a simple introduction a video in some cases, and then links that go into the press books where they need to uh, access that learning content. Once again, I mentioned we have an assessment that sits at the end of the OER 101 module. So we did modules one through four as the first learning chunk. So there's an assessment there where they can qualify for a badge and then OER a deeper dive, which results in the OER champion badge. That's the next series of modules that takes place there. So I mentioned previously uh, in our conversation today that we do have a two-part digital badge sequence that is associated with this. So individuals ultimately for their assessments in the course complete a Google quiz form or a Google form quiz, I should say. So modules one through four, ultimately, if they completed and earned the 80% score, which we followed again with Open Texas and what they did there, they earned the OER 101 badge. So has the skill tags associated with those learning outcomes, discusses you know, validation of their uh, competencies there. It's a foundational program. It takes hours to complete and it's free for individuals to enroll in. And then again, when they complete the second series of modules, they can qualify for the OER champion badge, which recognizes those deeper level competencies and also specifies that they have to earn the 101 badge before they can get the part two. I should mention as well, uh, just for the sake of it, that our digital badging initially, we started piloting it through Badger because Badger offers a free digital badging platform for issuers. Uh, but we did actually take advantage of our enterprise agreement with Credly that's facilitated through the state regions and are now offering our badges on the same platform that we're actually using system-wide for micro-credentials and digital badges elsewhere. The last bit of great news that I'll share before we open up for questions, again, is about that funding that we've received for FY23 to actually compensate faculty or provide awards for them, as well as staff members such as librarians, instructional designers, and technologists, uh, other individuals, again, that provide these supportive roles for faculty as they embark on OER. They're eligible now for $50 awards that will be dispersed through their institution. Uh, all of our Oklahoma public Colleges and universities, faculty and staff are eligible as long as they have, again, one of those roles that caters towards working with open education. And we're just requiring at this point completion of the OER 101 module. So the real goal behind providing this funding is to bring that awareness, you know, through a small incentive of those basic tenets of open education and helping faculty understand how they can utilize Creative Commons licensing in the scholarly work that they do. I would invite you to connect with us at any point if you want to learn more about this adaptation story, if you're thinking about adapting either our setup of the uh, OER basics and beyond, or even the Texas setup, if we can be of help. Uh, I think that the cool part about what we've done here and also what Texas has done is these resources in the training program could really be adapted at about any scale. So all of our faculty can complete a singular quiz and we actually have the ability to give our OER council members the opportunity to provide feedback to them. So uh, we can call on those volunteers as we need to as more and more faculty hopefully come through this program and help each other on a state level uh, versus having to do it individually. But again, and I think with the resources and the way this is structured, anybody at any size of institution could provide this as a great resource for faculty and staff. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen here and ask if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask or maybe any feedback about uh, what you've seen, you know, with this transition from the Google Sites version over to what we've done here uh, and really appreciate your time this afternoon. Thank you so much, Brad, for sharing your presentation with us. Um, we'll go into Q&A now. Uh, feel free to put your questions in the chat, or if you prefer to unmute yourself and ask a question, you can do so. I do first want to read out this comment in the chat from Carrie, um, who said, this is a wonderful adaptation. I really like the Pressbooks and Moodle formats for this, not to mention the OER digital badges you created. Thank you for sharing, Brad. 
Thank you so much, Carrie. And again, none of this would have been possible without you, you know, and the work that you and your team did in Texas. Uh, and Judith, I see you also in the chat there. It's wonderful to have you on the call. And I really do thank Judith also for being the one that shared this information. We sit on a couple of statewide consortium groups together. Uh, and I was just floored, honestly, whenever I realized what a resource Texas had developed and how easy it would be for us to take advantage of this opportunity. So while we wait to see if any other attendees have questions, I have a question or two for you, Brad. Um, so you might have mentioned this and I missed it, but I'm wondering how many people have completed the modules or received the badge? So to date, I would calculate that we've actually had about 45 faculty and staff that have completed this. And it really has been a decent mixture between our own OER practitioners that sit on the council and faculty that are at their institutions. We have also launched within the last couple of months faculty grants, both for Pressbooks projects and for adoption through other platforms. So having this as a first requirement step for them as participating in those grants, I'm expecting that we're going to see a really rapid scale up over the next month or two. Uh, and again, with us also just starting to market these $50 awards that we have available, um, I, I'd like to answer that question again like two or three months from now because I think it's going to really scale. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you may have touched on my next question for you um, with this being kind of the first step into these other programs. So I was going to ask if you could talk a little bit more about how you introduce people uh, to the modules and badges, like what kind of outreach is involved in that? How do you get people into this? Yeah, so we luckily have a communications team that we're able to take advantage of at our central office. And uh, I for lack of you know, wanting to innovate more on how we market, we actually do rely a lot on simple PDF flyers. Again, I work a lot with a representative you know, from each institution. And so giving them resources ultimately that they can use and share with faculty has really been the biggest area of success. I also have a connection to our council of academic officers, our council of library directors, our faculty senate council as well. So I'm consistently out there marketing these opportunities and sharing that they're available. Available um, again with those flyers and trying to make it easy for them to access it, you know, as few interfaces as they can, as few clicks as they can. Fantastic. It sounds like you've got a, a lot of great relationships that help with sharing this with people. I think so. Yeah. All right. I'm not seeing any questions come in. Feel free to add them if you have them, though. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and wrap up. Thank you again so much, Brad, for your presentation. Thank you for the opportunity. Everybody have a wonderful Friday. All right, thank you. And I will pause the recording. All right, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's session of Open Texas 2022. My name is Ariana, um, and I'm moderating this session. Um, thank you all for joining us today, and I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Ursula and Una for their presentation. So take it away. Great. Uh, thank you so much, Ariana. Can everyone hear me okay? Okay, super. Yes. Well, thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Um, I know I'm thrilled to be here uh, to tell you a little bit about growing equitable open education organizations and leaders. And I'm really thrilled to be here with Ursula who has led that effort for the Community College Consortium for OER um, as the founding VP of um, our, our equity effort. And um, I'm gonna let Ursula introduce herself. Hello everyone. Uh, my name is Ursula Pike. I'm the Associate Director of the Digital Higher Ed Consortium of Texas, also called Digitex. I'm also a member of CCC OER's Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Committee. Thank you, Ursula. And I'm Una Daly, uh, the Director of the Community College Consortium for OER um, at Open Education Global. And um, what else can I tell you? <laughs> Let's see. Let's go to the next slide, Ursula, please. So, um, so um, I, I lead the, the CCCOER, as we call ourselves for short, um, organization. And um, we were actually founded back in 2007. So we were fairly early um, in this process. Um, and 
it was always about helping students to succeed with OER, uh, particularly students from marginalized backgrounds, um, such as low income, students of color and students with disabilities. Of course, that's changed. That has, that has remained the same, that focus, but we've also broadened our focus. So we also, um, we also work on open education practices and policies over the last few years. Um, I would say over the last seven years, we've broadened. So we're 15 years old uh, this year. So it's really, really exciting. And uh, we are thrilled to work with, um, as you can see, colleges across the country in Texas uh, through the Digitex leadership. We have 20 college members um, that we work with on a regular basis. And I hope that you've heard about some of the um, opportunities that we provide in addition to our EDI work. We have, um, we have monthly webinars, professional development opportunities, which um, if you join our community email uh, list, and there's the link there, it's a free email list, um, you will find out about those events coming up um, and can decide if you want to attend them or listen to the recordings. Um, we also um, have um, advocacy events throughout the year, including Open Education Week. So that's run by our, our Open Education Global uh, Parent Organization. Um, and we do case studies uh, with our members and with other community members around the exciting projects that they do. And um, next slide, please. And what we're hoping you'll learn today is uh, some effective strategies for creating culture focused on using open education to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion. And you'll hear about some lessons learned, uh, particularly from Ursula about how transforming culture is destined to be a work in progress um, that requires many hands. And um, I would say that um, the labor sometimes falls on those from um, communities that have been traditionally underserved and uh, makes it difficult for them to uh, earn a living and also do open ed on the side, which um, unfortunately sometimes it's, it, some institutions expect that. And I know that uh, we, that this conference has been all about um, supporting, um, supporting uh, marginalized uh, workers uh, in, in their OER work and, um, and making sure that they're compensated fairly. So thank you, um, Ursula. And so I wanna say that for many of us, spring and summer of 2020, and oh, I'm sorry, there's a typo. <laughs> <laughs> on that slide, it should say 2020, was really an inflection point. Um, and um, so, so many organizations and institutions um, started to um, express um, a need to be more equitable and anti-racist as this growing awareness of structural racism uh, really dawned on um, us and, and particularly in higher ed for all of us. And CCCOER had, a, for a long time, had a, um, an EDI blog, as we call it, Equity, Diversity, Inclusion blog. But, it, but in fact, um, we wanted to be more active and we needed to be more active. And so we started a learning community uh, that summer, uh, meeting uh, monthly to discuss topics that were coming up for people. And um, as, as that effort matured, um, we launched actually a planning leadership committee called the Next Steps Committee. And that is what uh, Ursula fortunately stepped into the leadership of that program. And um, it grew from there. Uh, next slide, please. And as that learning community uh, kind of um, drifted off as the pandemic continued and, and it was hard for the large community to meet on a monthly basis, the EDI committee really took hold um, and it became part of the CCCOER strategic planning around professional development um, and other areas of our program. And um, we also at that time, CCCOER was able to launch the Open for Anti-Racism program, which is I'm not gonna speak about today, but something is in our California community colleges. And we also run some other programs focused on this. And the EDI committee has done many, many exciting things um, over the last two years. And I know uh, specifically, um, Ursula is gonna co concentrate on the amazing book club that has run for the last two years. And over to you, Ursula. Great, thank you so much, Una. Um, yeah, so as Una said in 2020, 
uh, several members of CCC OER came together. Um, Una, and I also want to recognize the early leadership of Quill West from Pierce College in Washington State. Um, they, uh, I worked with them really closely early on, uh, figuring out what were we, we were going to do about this. Um, they, but they really were instigators. Uh, they sent out a general call and, and a bunch of folks like me and others uh, responded and, and we came together. We didn't even know what to call ourselves at first. We didn't know exactly what we were going to do, but we just kind of blindly <laughs> moved forward. Um, but the EDI committee's work um, ended up supporting CCC OER's strategic plan. And actually the first pillar of CCC OER is to advocate for open educational practices to empower contributors from diverse learners and educators who have been underrepresented. So the OER movement is deeply rooted in ensuring equitable access to information. And as many people have pointed out at this conference from the keynotes to many of the individual sessions, there's more we can do to help increase equity, diversity, and inclusion in our resources and our practices. And you know, on the committee, we really believe that OER has the potential to create equitable learning experiences for all students and to empower instructors. But we also learned that it doesn't happen by accident. Um, so what do we do? You know, we, we had this EDI blog. Uh, there was a blog, existing blog that some people had contributed to, um, and we just worked hard to maybe have more consistent posts to it, addressing different kinds of issues, not necessarily saying here's a solution, but kind of exploring issues. Um, we invited educators from diverse backgrounds and um, we really emphasize flexible participation. You know, some people are really busy and they're teaching and they wanna be involved. And, and we were really, we wanted to make sure, we, we do make sure that people understand that if they can only come to one meeting a semester, we are fine with that. If they can't be very involved this year, then the next year they can be maybe more involved or if they can only be involved in the summer. We really emphasize that participation, that people can have their own participation or what works for them. We advise the CCC OER staff and exec council. We participate in strategic planning. We advise um, professional development topics and speakers help identify, and we often speak on the um, professional development webinars ourselves. And then we present uh, at state like this, and national conferences on open education. Um, and sometimes we advise folks who are just uh, starting out in OER and are trying to look at equity even as they're just beginning to explore it at their institution. One of our biggest um, projects that we learned so much from uh, were these summer book clubs. And I, and I saw that uh, in the attendees, there are some folks who, who were part of these book clubs. And uh, I hope during the Q&A session, if we have time, we could get some feedback from you folks. Uh, but we, in the summer of 2021, um, you know, there was a group meeting that were, they called themselves a community of practice and community of learning. And they were just trying to explore some issues. It was less about uh, professional development and more about just kind of exploring some of these issues. So the first book we picked was From Equity Talk to Equity Walk, Expanding Practitioner Knowledge for Racial Justice in Higher Education. And that book, it was really easy to pick because all of us had been meaning to read it. We'd been wanting to read it. Many of us already had a copy or had already read it. So we were just like, let's do this book. So um, we set it up so we had multiple facilitators uh, at each session. We, it was over a summer. We had about six different meetups. We used OEG Connect um, to have questions, have dis asynchronous discussions about it, to let people introduce themselves outside of the um, every two week meetings that we had. And, um, and sometimes those went well, sometimes we weren't really sure how to engage people as well. That's something that's definitely a work in progress, but it's a great resource. Um, and then at the end of it, we surveyed everyone and, and found out what their experiences were. And, um, 
And then we decided to do this again in 2022. And choosing that book was a little bit more, um, I don't know, we, we weren't really sure. We wanted to focus a little bit more on practical strategies that the faculty and librarians and staff in the book club could, could implement. Because um, as wonderful as From Equity Walk to Equity Talk was, and I think everyone should read it, um, it was a little bit um, more about systemic level changes that could be made. And we wanted some things that we could implement. Um, so, and also in that second year, we created a facilitator's handbook and we trained the facilitators. We brought them together and um, a, specifically focused on inclusive facilitation. And one thing I wanted to say is it's often the case that when we present, when we submit a proposal to a presentation to talk about the book club, at least one reviewer will always say, well, what's so revolutionary about a book club? My mom's in a book club, you know? And I think that um, our book club, we really get into some deep discussions about equity and what we can do and what our organizations have done. Um, and anyway, so next year, uh, so right now we're developing a web page. We hope to do another book club next year. Um, so it's an ongoing um, process. One of the most invent, one of the most important parts of our book club is these community norms. At the beginning of every single session, we read these community norms, and um, these are three excerpts. Um, at the end, uh, I will, during the q and I'll put a link to the full uh, community norms, but I'm just gonna, I think I have time to read uh, this first one, but I think this is really important for establishing the tone of the book club discussions. Acknowledge that the burden of EDI work disproportionately lies on Black, Indigenous, Brown, Latinx, Asian, and other communities of color, LGBTQIA, and persons with disabilities. I, it, it's really helpful. And sometimes it takes a, a little while to read all of the community norms, because I think that there are about eight. Um, but it, it's really important for to reiterate that at the beginning of every single gathering. So here's some of the things uh, that people have said that in the book club, when we surveyed them, uh, it was a safe space to gather with other people to discuss EDI issues related to their own experiences and the book. And it was great to do this deeper dive on equity with colleagues across different schools and systems. One of the most important things that we took away from that very first book club when we read From Equity Walk to Equity Talk is that we are, most of us, first generation equity practitioners. We're learning and we're making mistakes. And I think it's also important, we learned also that people of color aren't all equity workers. You know, I know that I may be someone who, my experience, I can see microaggressions or, or see them when they're perpetrated on me or others, but I don't always know how to address them. And um, we need structured opportunities and examples to try, fail, and learn how to implement equity. And, um, and one really important part about surveying our, um, the participants of the first year was we, we really adapted our process because of them. And that's why we created that training and focused on inclusive um, meeting facilitation. But the, the last thing I want to say about, about the group is that, you know, there were definitely some challenges and we learned some lessons. Um, we learned that equity, an equity lens cannot be um, given to a project retroactively. Like when you try and come in and say, hey, here's this thing we did, can you kind of look at it and equitize it and make it um, more equitable and diverse, that isn't really possible. And also it's how things are implemented. It's really difficult to step in and review for equity. And I think we've learned that the more we can get involved at the beginning of a process and plan along with it, then the more equitable it can be. 
Um, and, you know, one thing I've seen is that one exciting thing is Dr. Shinta Hernandez, who was one of the founding members of the equity committee, she now is the uh, the chair, the VP of the professional development committee. And so, I mean, she she taught us, she's an expert in, in equity work. So I just think that's so exciting to have her now be leading the professional development committee. Another thing is burnout, you know, we really have to be honest about how hard this work can be, especially for people from marginalized backgrounds. And to address that, one thing that we did is we had co-VPs um, in our committee. So um, I was joined by the phenomenal Tanja Connerly, um, and she was a co-VP for me and it that first year or that second year, and it really helped um, move us forward the work of two people was much more effective than just me by myself. And we've continued that model going forward. Uh, we also focus on the needs of students, faculty, librarian, and staff. Sometimes when we're talking about OER, I feel like we are assuming we have white faculty and black and brown students, but it's really been important to recognize that marginalized faculty and staff are here too, um, dealing with inequities, but then also working to, to solve them. Um, inclusive engagement takes work, as I said, Transforming culture is destined to be a work in progress that requires many hands. So I'm not sure how close we are to time. Um, so I'll, I'll go to the next slide. Um, I don't know, Una, if you wanted to address some of the ways that people can get involved. Um, that, that's just a promo slide. Let's go ahead and do Q and A. <laughs> It's a pretty picture. <laughs> yes, thank you both so much for your presentation. That was fantastic and you're doing a lot of important work. We have a few minutes for Q&A, so if folks have questions, feel free to ask them. Um, I have a quick question for you. It's um, how can someone get involved with CCC OER or be involved in, in like the book club or anything else like that? Are there any requirements or is there any membership involved? Um, do you want to answer Ursula or? Well, I think that one question I have is, um, Ariana, you're at uh, University of Houston? Yes. Yeah. And I think that with the book club, I think um, anyone could could join. Um, and so if you are interested, um, there's a you can add your name to that newsletter. And so then we would we would notify you when the book club is coming up, I, I believe. Una, if there's a better way for someone to get involved. Um, with the book club, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not absolutely sure. I think, yeah, either contact me or Ursula would be great. Um, what I would say, uh, just as repeating what Ursula said, is almost, uh, the book club was open to everyone uh, to participate, all community members. In fact, almost all of CCCOER's activities are open to the entire open education community. However, the planners and the leaders come from our members and because of course, they're the ones that are helping to sustain and grow um, the work. Um, but we want to make sure we share this with everyone so that the benefit is there for any, anyone who's interested in open education. Fantastic, that's really helpful to know. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions come in. Um, so I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. And thank you again so much, Ursula and Una. Thank you. Thank you for supporting us, Ariana. And we'd love to have you um, <laughs> join our book club. Absolutely. <laughs> I will keep an eye out for it. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and pause the recording now. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this afternoon's session of the Open Texas Conference. I will be moderating the session. My name is Ariana, um, but I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to our next presenter, Josh Halpern. So if you're ready, Josh, go ahead and take it away. Thank you. Uh, is my voice level OK? Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Sounds good. OK. Uh, first, before I start, let me toss some flowers to CCCO. It's a great uh, email list to join if you want to find out where all the OER is that you need. Uh, very good conversation. I've also put some information into the uh, 
chat for getting in touch with me. And I want to share my screen. And here we go. Uh, and let me start the slideshow. I'm going to talk about uh, Libertex. Libertex has been around since about 2008. Uh, there's some contact information there. Our executive director, Delmar Larson, started the effort with one textbook back in 2008. Uh, we've have support from principally from the Department of Education now, but also from NASA, NSF, and the California Learning Lab. We're a bunch of faculty, and that's kind of how we we go. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about education. Recitation from memory is the oldest education tool, and we still write on walls. But textbooks have been around for a long time, uh, going back to 5000 BC or so. And I want to tell you that Libertex and OER is the newest and best way uh, education tool. We've seen this several times probably uh, in this conference. The UNESCO definition is probably the best working definition now. But I'd like to think a little bit about OER and education. There are four players here. There's the faculty. And the thing about the faculty is the faculty choose the textbooks and the educational material that the students use. And of course we have administrators and we have commercial publishers. And we, in OER, we're trying to replace the commercial publishers who are making the materials for the students very expensive to the point where within the last decade or so, the students have stopped buying textbooks. Okay, so you're at this conference, you're convinced that now's the time to adopt OER, where do you start? Well, one way is to learn how to use Libertex and to find the OER your colleagues have authored and remixed into customized OER text with a state-of-the-art system. Libertex is an independent nonprofit public benefit organization we have about 20 institutions now in our network and that's growing rapidly and a hundred or so faculty are involved in the project governance. Many, many more contribute and use the content. We're a community of faculty and we're dedicated to providing excellent educational materials that are truly accessible and comprehensive. Within Libertex, we've created a system that uh, you can use to create materials for your course and your students. Our libraries span the undergraduate curriculum. Instructors can remix and add content quickly and simply. You can actually create a textbook in a matter of 10 or 15 minutes if you have a table of all the pieces you wanna to put together. So there's zero cost to students, faculty and institutions to use the material we have a cloud-based infrastructure with no local IT costs. And because we operate on in the cloud, uh, we're available literally 24 seven. Somebody's watching it all the time. Uh, we have moved into a system that's gonna really enable analysis of student learning in our homework system. And we can use this data to drive improvement Since the plague hit, since March, 2020, over 4,000 new instructor accounts have been opened. Each instructor you gets a sandbox. We have team sandboxes if you want to work together. We have a drag and drop remixer where you can literally take any page from any area and put it into your textbook. You can mix together statistics and psychology, or biology and chemistry, anything you want. We hold virtual workshops at least twice a year. We have bi-weekly office hours to help you out. We have a YouTube channel where we record all the workshops and other material, and we have an on-ramp for newbies. We have a lot of student developers who work together with us 
And their principal job is if some faculty member says, here's this press book, I really like things here, but you don't have it in Libertex format. And I'll speak a little bit later about why having a uniform format is important. Uh, we can have the students work with you to bring the material into our system. This, this is getting a little wordy, but right now we have over 2000 texts with over 450,000 pages that you can remix. Any institution can have up to five customized texts in the campus bookshelves. After that, we ask that you join our network and I'll talk again about that later. Uh, we have common cartridge integration into your learning management system. Every book, chapter, and page is available as a PDF. We're moving to an ebook format because that is better for accessibility. Uh, we have an online bookstore. You can order a physical book through lulu.com or you can print it yourself. Uh, we found that about 25% of students prefer to have printed material. We're developing, we have a centralized system, but we're developing an app, which we call Solo. That means if you wanted to run Libertex on your own platform, you could. And we have uh, an app for Raspberry Pis so that you can take a Raspberry Pi into the field, into very remote locations and run at least some section of Libertex. Our books have online have reading assistance. You can control the texts and margin size, dark mode, and more. We have annotation, and several of the uh, faculty who have created Libertex have used this to create annotated uh, books for their class. Uh, their, everything is available through a commons. And we're, for the librarians, we are recently indexed in Ex Libris Alma Primo, and we're soon going to be in the EBSCO discovery system. So that's student access. How about your building Libertex? We've moved to a single sign-on through the campus email system. As I said, team sandboxes, access to the commons area for housing other materials, slide decks, things like that, our remixer. Within our page editor, we now have at a fairly good level, automatic accessibility checking. Uh, we have on every, every paragraph in LibreText has a numbering that tells you where it came from and basically who the authors were at the paragraph level. The system set up so that if you uh, brought something into your textbook and changed it slightly, uh, you can set it up so that if the pages you brought it in from are changed, you get a notice. Uh, we can, we have dynamic index, which is built every time you access the index based on meta tags that you've set. We have a dynamic table of contents. So if you change something, the table of contents updates immediately. All of the edits that you make are retained. So you can go back, roll over glossaries, uh, for those of you in STEM, we have a MathJax equation editor, and these are automatically renumbered. So you don't have to, get, if you change something in the middle, you don't have to go renumber everything below it. Uh, we have Jupyter servers for in textbook uh, calculations. Right now we have Python, R, a few others, uh, Octave, and of course, interactive simulations and visualizations can be seen. So, to help you out, we have general office hours twice a week and virtual LibreFest workshops. Uh, it's not quite cost-free. We ask that you pay $25 to attend. And the reason for that is when it was cost-free, uh, we had a lot of people sign up who didn't attend. But for the $25, you get a very nice LibreTex uh, t-shirt and some other things. So it's really... <laughs> It's well invested. Uh, we have a YouTube channel, as I said, community forums. We, because we have a uniform format, we can do curation using bots. And that speeds things up a lot. And we have access to question banks, and I'll get to that in a minute. 
we will provide training, extra training at extra cost. So we'll provide a jumpstart for non-members. Uh, if you join the network, the first jumpstart is free. We have uh, in-person workshops, professional development, things like that. Okay. We will provide a professional accessibility review uh, and development. Uh, we will provide ISBN numbers. There, there is a call for that occasionally, but it, it's kind of awkward because it requires freezing content, which is kind of against what OER is really about. OER is about creating something to me and then improving it constantly. We have a network. So if, you, if this institution joins our network and the cost is $1,000 per year per institution, slightly different for systems, uh, then you can have an unlimited number of texts. You can also get your own campus comments and that provides a single site for all your texts and ancillary material. You can manage that. Uh, we have a conductor system for OER project management. Very nice, newly came online. We have campus branded textbooks, uh, access to traffic analytics for your Libre text. Uh, I mentioned the jumpstart before, priority harvesting and priority access to emerging technology. We have a lot of emerging technology that's coming up. Now, one of the things that's happened in the last two or three years is commercial publishers have really stopped selling textbooks and they sell selling homework systems, especially in the SEM area. So we have uh, a, a, what we call our ADAPT homework system. There's free access to the questions and solutions, but we don't provide auto-checking uh, of the answers for free. We provide everybody, every instructor will get, will get one functioning course with unlimited students for one term. California students will have an unlimited number of courses with unlimited number of students. And that's because the state has adopted ADAPT. Uh, they're actually funding the fur further development. Uh, Texas could do that, we'd be happy. Uh, so, but other than for that first course, because we need to support an infrastructure, uh, we need uh, to support servers, uh, we have some costs. So if the students pay directly, we're gonna limit the cost to $30 per year for all costs, courses. If the campus pays, we're providing a, um, a benefit of 300 students covered plus blocks of a thousand students courses. Uh, student courses per year for $5,000. That works out to what? $5 per student course, which is quite low. We also have an H5P studio. Everybody has access to the studio for H5P construction, collection, and curation in their Libre texts. But if you're a member, you have full access to the Libre, Libre studio app, and you can use the questions wherever and at however you want. Now I'm gonna take a few minutes and talk a, a little bit about accessibility. It's been very narrowly defined in my judgment. Accessibility really means that the environment can be altered to enhance the individual's probability to participate in a meaningful way to that individual. And that means for Libertex, we want for the material to be accessible, it has to be there. So it has to be sustainable. That's where we work, we work very hard at that. It has to be available to everyone everywhere. Cost is a basic accessibility issue. If you can't afford it, you don't have it. Technology is basic. Ease of use is basic. And customizability is a basic accessibility issue because if you can't relate to the material, it's not accessible to you. Right now, we're getting about 100 million page views per, per year, actually a little more than that. Uh, we have chemistry libraries, our home library, but right now the growth is largest in the non-chemistry libraries. Uh, we're the most visited OER project on the net outside of Wikimedia. 
This is back in July. We have 800 million total page views. We're going to hit a billion total page, page views in by the end of winter. This shows you who uses Libertex, and the answer is everywhere. We've even had readers in Greenland. Okay. We're globally, as I said, all of these things before. Um, here's, a, here's a little Raspberry Pi. You put that together with a hotspot and a solar cell, and you can host Libertex in remote locations for under $200. And our solo FOSS app is ready to roll out. Okay. One of the nice things we do with our printed books is we include a QR code on the videos. So you can point your phone at the QR code, you're reading a book, and you can see the video. EPUB is coming. One of the things about textbooks is that uh, textbook marketing shifts costs to students. Faculty specify the textbooks, publishers market to the faculty, by providing ancillary services, those nice course packs you get. Interestingly, inclusive access is not marketed to faculty, but it's marketed to administrators, which cuts faculty off. And homework systems, again, are specified by faculty and force student purchase. And students react by not buying them or finding copies, which is educationally harmful and it's ethically harmful. You're, by specifying, an expensive textbook, you're leading students to try and find it uh, in non-official sources, let's put it that way. The usual way that people think about OER is a faculty member finds OER in some library somewhere and points the students to it. But these things, this model doesn't really work. It's basically, I have a printed textbook and now I have a textbook. Uh, there are high operating costs and network fees, there's link rot, and there's, it's, this is somewhat static. So we have a kind of different way of looking at it that the faculty member can find the textbook, can create their own textbook, uh, they can point their students to it, the students can actually interact with the book, uh, there are learning analytics, there's uh, homework systems, there's annotation, all these things surround the library. And here's a nice example of what somebody's done. Uh, so J Jacqueline Bird at uh, St. Mary's Notre Dame uh, had her student collaborators edit footnote and create critical introductions to uh, humanities texts. Hi, Josh. I'm so sorry to have to cut you off, but we are all out of time. We may have okay. time to take one quick question if there are any. So I'll just give sure. a moment to see if any questions come in. Sure. I do want to say it's so great to see all of the built in support there is for people using LibreTech, like those office hours and workshops and community forum and all of that. So that's something that I really took away from this that I found helpful. Okay. And you can get in touch with us. All right, thank you so much. I'm not seeing any questions. I want to thank all of our presenters today for your fantastic presentations. And thank you everyone for attending the Open Texas Conference. I'll go okay. ahead and stop the recording now. Okay.